Ladies, please, you have to calm down. I talked to Dawit this morning. He says, every boy over the age of 12 will train to become warriors. It's non-negotiable. D, come on, you can do something about this, Tanya cried. What you want her to do, girl? She said, the man said, the issue is non-negotiable. You seen what happened yesterday. Deke could have gotten killed, my bell said, bending down angrily, snatching some weed out of the garden bed. Little Yafa sat on my lap, with her head laid against my chest, sucking on her thumb. I dipped my head and inhaled her baby scent. I missed her last night. Um, yeah, right. He don't want to kill D. We all know what he want to do to D. I jerked my head up looking at Maggie as if she had gone crazy. And just what is that supposed to mean, young lady? She laughed, and so did Tanya, Portia, and Cheyenne. My bell just shook her head. Well, I'll be. The women of this compound thought they had some things figured out. Well, I was getting ready to set the record straight. Oh, come on, D. Don't act like there ain't nothing going on with you and the new master, Portia said. You mean the young master, as in younger than me? I shook my head at them. What I look like, a Kruger? You think I don't have nothing better to do with my time than try to keep up with some man that's young enough to be... To be... I was at a loss for words. He wasn't young enough to be my son, and to say he was young enough to be my little brother would sound stupid. My bell looked up at me from where she was, in her knees in the dirt. She put her hand on her hip. Young enough to be what, she asked. Your younger lover, with a nice strong back? She held back her head and laughed. Child, who you trying to convince with that old, I'm such an old woman and he's so much younger than me act? It ain't no act. It's plenty of women around here his age. And I'm sure it won't be long before one of them catch his eye. I gestured towards Portia, Cheyenne, and Maggie, who were all young and beautiful. Oh, we. Oui. I wish he did look at me the way he looks at you. Girl, I would be all over that. D, look, you tripping. He is fine as all get out. My bell swatted her granddaughter with a towel. You see, that's why you ain't gonna never get a man like that. You're too fast. Men like that, they don't go for the easy women. Cause he's a hunter. He needs to hunt. Cheyenne rolled her eyes at her grandmother. That ain't what I heard, she said, instantly getting everybody's attention. You see, Cheyenne was the information Google around here. She knew everybody's business and wasn't afraid to share it. I tried to act like I can care less what she heard, but hell, who was I kidding? I wanted to know. What you hear, child? My bell said. Portia, Tanya, and Maggie got closer. Cover the baby ears, Cheyenne said. I'm ashamed to say I did just that. She looked around trying to make sure none of Dawi's people were close. I heard that many a nights girls like me slipped into his tent. She looked around again. They say he a hard man, rarely talks to them. Say he just talks to his men and his men take his orders back to his people. See, I guess something bad happened to him. I think they say his whole family got killed or something like that. So he's like the loner type, you know what I mean? They say, although he is leading them, 
he normally rides ahead on his motorcycle. Anyway, all the single ladies be trying to get his attention, you know, but they say he's not really interested. Don't pay him no, never mind. She looked around. I started to yank her by her throat. Why in the hell was she dragging this out? Anyway, so you know how determined some women can get. You know, straight trashy. Rumor has it, this here child's mother was the boldest of the bunch. You see, she thought because she was the prettiest, it was only natural for her to be his woman. However, nothing that she did worked, child, at getting his notice. And it wasn't no secret that some nights she looked around. I grinded down on my teeth. I was going to hurt this girl. Some nights, some hoochie mamas slipped in his tent. And uh, rumor has it, they didn't come out till morning. You know what I mean? They say this child's mama had determined that when she slipped in, he wasn't going to put her out with the sun. They say she lied, girl. Told him she was pregnant when she really wasn't. But after she told him, girl, he married her. Then you know how that go. A few months later, she really, you know, get pregnant. But they say oh boy didn't appreciate her lying to him. And he never touched her again. She looked around. Now, I don't know how much of that is true. You know how I feel about gossiping. That's why I don't even pay no never mind when it come my way. My bell rolled her eyes at her, shaking her head. But you see, she continued, all these girls got a thing for him, mama, she told me. And he got a thing for you. And all I'm saying is, a man that look that good with all them damn muscles. I mean, dude got muscles on top of muscles. He's so big. And I bet, ooh, girl, I bet he can wear a sister in the bedroom, straight up having her climbing walls and whatnot. Okay, Portia said. She clapped hands real loudly with Cheyenne. I shook my head. Goodness, the youth. Sad. Maggie nodded her head. No, 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 seriously, dude. I can tell a man that knows his way around a woman's body, and that be one of them. I sure wouldn't mind letting him run a couple laps around mine. I looked at my bell, shaking my head, waiting for her to agree with me. She looked at me, and she shook her head, but not in the way that she agreed. I laughed. Just a minute ago, y'all wanted me to shoot him for making y'all babies train. But, my, 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 how have your stories changed? The child, my bell said. I don't normally agree with this heathen granddaughter of mine, but uh, that we do got that look about him, you know what I mean? I was getting ready to open my mouth to tell her how she a bad influence on these girls when a raven cried from a tree high up in the mountains before it flew across the sky, its piercing cry causing my heart to freeze. Instantly, I was on high alert. I shuddered when my emotions, like a light switch, turned off. I was in tune with everything that was going on around me. Simon stepped into the doorway across the crowded yard. Our eyes connected. The raven passed overhead one more time before it was gone. I stood. My bell, I need you to watch Yaffa for me. My bell's head shot up as her eyes connected with mine. None of the other women noticed the change in me. They continued talking and cackling about the things they wanted Dawid to do to them. Everything all right? My bell asked, coming to her feet, her worry showing on her face. I nodded once. Yes. I need to go out for a little bit. Yafa clutched at my hand. She didn't want me to leave. I squatted down to her level. I have to go for a little while. I will come back and I will bring you a treat, okay? With her thumb still in her mouth, she walked closer to me and wrapped her little arm around my head, hugging my face. I exhaled because something strange was happening. I felt 
I felt although I was still in heightened mode. I wrapped my arms around her and I hugged her close. I felt love. My bell stared down at me with a teary smile on her face. Dear Yah, miracles do exist, she said, clapping her hands together. I kissed Yaffa on her little fat cheeks, and I stood. When I turned to face the building, though, all the love I felt was gone. Once again, I felt nothing. It's been 12 years, Simon said when I walked into the building headed toward the loft. He fell into step with me. I know, it can only be one thing. Simon shook his head, that's impossible. We covered our tracks. As far as any of them concerned, we died in Bosnia before the flare hit. I walked into the loft and went to my closet, taking down my leather pants and vest off the hanger. I know. They must have found us. The raven wouldn't risk coming here unless it was to warn us. He nodded. I went into the bathroom, shutting the door. We're going to have to leave. If we stay, we're going to put all these people in danger. He spoke through the door. I know. Damn it. Look, I said, coming out the bathroom, dressed for riding. Let me find out what's going on. You just stay here and keep a lookout. Keep your ears open, Simon. You know how sick Scott is. He nodded. Both of us left out of the loft, but he headed towards the main stairs, and I went the opposite direction toward the back. I wanted to avoid running into Dawi, so I took the back stairs down to the basement, where my baby waited for me. It shined, breaking through the darkness. I sat on my Dodge Tomahawk. This was one of the fastest motorcycles in America. A gift from the devil himself. Oh, General Scotty boy. It could reach 350 miles in 17 seconds. 500 horsepower. Oh, yes. And guess what I called it? Black Beauty. Ha! I slipped my helmet on my head, and minutes later, I was in the wind. The raven would not risk waiting too long. It was too dangerous. A half an hour later, I brought my bike to a stop outside the gun shack, an old rundown bar that was inhabited by lost souls just waiting to die. I kicked my leg over the bike standing. Several nameless faces watched me with weary eyes. I smiled as I placed my helmet on my seat. I didn't worry that anybody would touch it. They knew better. As soon as I stepped into the bar, I was consumed with the scent of unwashed bodies, cigarettes, smoke, and alcohol. I scanned the crowd, spotting the raven instantly. Her black hair flowed down her back in her long black curls. She stood at the old jukebox. For the life of me, I had no idea how the thing still worked. I took a seat at the bar. We, we, we don't want no trouble, Black Beauty. Roger, the old bartender said as he limped down to where I sat. I narrowed my eyes at him. His voice was shaky. Guilt. You got something you want to tell me, Roger? I asked. With shaking hands, he used a dirty towel to wipe his even dirtier alcohol swollen face. Please don't kill me. They came here and they snatched me right up off the floor over yonder. But I didn't tell him nothing, though. Who, Roger? Who didn't you tell nothing to? The old man's eyes began to water. A big man, brown dreadlocks, a real thug, you know? Not like the fine folks from around here. Dawid. So that's how he found me. I pointed at Roger. I'm gonna deal with you later, I told him, showing him away, because after selecting the old country western song, Raven made her way to me. We embraced. I see you still got bad taste in music, I told him. She threw her pretty head back and laughed. I'm a country girl, always will be. I smiled as she took a seat. It was good to see her. She too had been a victim of father long after I had left the nest though. She was one of the top agents in the field. I can't stay long, Black Beauty. As you know, if I'm here, I come to warn you. The general knows you're alive. I frowned. How? Simon and I planned our deaths to the T. It was flawless. It's been 12 years. She nodded, motioning for the bartender. I know. Somebody ran your name through the CIA database. Two shots of whatever you got back there, she told Roger. He hurriedly prepared our drinks because he knew he was on thin ice. Who could have done that? 
I was ghost recon. Nobody even knows I exist outside of the agency. She downed her shot. Somebody knows you exist because they searched through your whole file. The next day, the general increased a bounty on your head. What is it now, I asked. She looked at me with sorrowful eyes. He doubled it. 20 mil. I closed my eyes. I was dead. 20 million? Everybody who thought they was something was going to come looking for me. But the flare, it, sh it shut down the web, I told her. She was shaking her head before I even finished speaking. They have rebuilt. Stronger than before. Only, there is no unity. There is no worldwide network anymore. The power structure has pretty much been split into three nations. And they are at war with each other. But the general, he is obsessed with getting you back. He wants you brought in alive. He doesn't care about the fishermen though. He'll take Simon dead or alive. Beauty, you have to run. If he gets his hands on you, she didn't have to finish her statement. The government blamed me for what happened. It was my mission to kill the doctor before he came forth with his truce about my people. Not only did I not kill him, I assisted him and made sure he had safe passage to do his work. Then I hid him in a safe place. The doctor's dead, she said. I inhaled. I didn't feel anything right now, but I know later that was going to hurt. How? I asked. The general found him shortly after the flare hit. He tortured him for days trying to get the man to say that you were alive, but he never spoke. She closed her eyes and slowly shook her head. He tortured him bad. He's crazy. What about you? I asked. How is you still working for him? She shrugged. Where else would I go? The only thing I know how to do is kill. It's the only thing I'm good at. The raven had been labeled poor white trash on her case file. It was easy for fathers to make her disappear. Her mother had OD'd on meth when she was just a baby and her father had been shot and killed in a bar brawl. By the time raven was 10, she had been selling her body on the streets, robbing her johns at gunpoint. She did her little song and dance act on an undercover cop and well, that was all she wrote. She had been arrested that day never to be seen again. She stood, Black Beauty, watch your back. Ever since your name was ran, the general is like a madman. He's not going to rest until he has you. Run baby, run as fast and as far as you can go. And then she was gone. I sat there looking in my reflection to the broken mirror behind the bar. I was so tired. Exhaling, I motioned for Roger. You all right, Black Beauty? Look like you just got some bad news, he said, looking down to where I sat. I nodded. You know, Roger, you can say that. I held out my hand, and it was as if he could read my mind. He slid the bottle of whiskey down to me. If Scott knew I was alive, I would be dead soon. I poured me a double shot and took it to the head. Of course, I felt nothing. Not even the burn I know should be there. I poured another. I was so tired of running. I was so tired of always having to look over my back. I downed the shot. Nothing. I poured another and then another. Maybe I had lost my mind. After the eighth shot, though, I felt something. I felt carefree. Ha! Imagine that. Imagine Deborah carefree. I stood toppling over the bar stool, slipping off my coat, and grabbing the bar, I easily flipped up to the top of it. Turn that crap up, I yelled at drunk Albert. With a huge grin on his face, he did just that. He turned up the old jukebox that spewed its old country song that spoke to my soul. I began to move my hips, stumping on the bar. You see, y'all, I was so tired. I was so ready to be carefree. I sat at a table in a dark corner of the old bar and watched her. 
She moved her hips in a sensual way that had every man attention in the place. I balled up my fist as I tried to control my rage. She danced on the bar and, and although clearly drunk, her feet were steady and light as a ninja's. She danced from the bar to the bar stool without causing the bar stool to fall. Superb balance, reminding me of Aki Natali. With the grace of a deer, she leaped to a table that was not stable at all, but she danced on it, moving her body, balancing on that wobbly table as if she was its centerpiece. Dear Ya, this woman, I had never seen anything like her. She was wearing leather pants that hugged her hips and bow legs, and that leather vest that was driving every man in here insane. I grinded down on my teeth. They were looking at her with want, and I was getting ready to lose it. Dear Yah, give me the strength. She leaped off the table to the middle of the floor and began clapping her hands over her head, still moving her hips seductively. Her eyes were closed. She wanted to give up. Whoever this general was, she was afraid of him. She had it in her mind that she was going to run away. A small group of men began to form a circle around her. I stood. That was enough of that. She was not theirs to look at. And if I was going to make it out of here without killing them, it was time for me to get my girl home. The men looked up and saw me and instantly went back to their holes and spots in this dirty place. Deborah had her arms raised over her head and she began rolling her hips. Her sexy stomach playing pickable with me, driving me mad. I balled up my fists, thanking Yah for my father who taught me restraint. I felt him before I saw him. That was Dawid for you though. The power that clung to him made everything else in the room dim in comparison when he came in too. Slowly I turned to face him still moving my body to the music. This man, oh, I smiled. Oh yes, he was definitely fine. That was something Cheyenne had been right about. And I remember that kiss we shared yesterday. He had made me feel like I had never thought I would a be able to feel. I wanted to feel something now. I was tired of going from feeling fear to feeling nothing and back and forth. I wanted to feel good for once in my life. Dawid, I whispered. He stopped in front of me. I still danced to the music, rubbing my body against his. Can you make me feel? The muscle ticked furiously in his cheek. It's time to go, beauty. I laughed up at him. Wrong answer, I spat before I turned and began to dance away from him. But I didn't get far because his strong arms shot out, wrapping around my waist, pulling me back up against his muscle body. I closed my eyes, slowly moving myself seductively against him. I heard him groan in my ear. Damn it, beauty. I'm not that strong, he whispered. Before his other arm wrapped around me, pulling me close, enveloping me in his heat. Roger stood there with his mouth open, his cigarette dangling from his lips. You see, around here there was no secret that I killed whoever touched me. These folks probably thought that we was some kind of avenging angel or something. Boss, a male voice came from behind us. Dawi looked up as Mad Max ran into the bar. You gotta come quick. Somebody attacked the third watch. Jerome got away, but... He was the only one. He said that they were attacked by a group of wild men. I shook my head. The damn Turk, I slurred. Who? Dawid asked, looking at me, a frown on his face. The Turk. He said until I agreed to marry him, he and his inbred group of savages will continue to attack our gates and our people. A look so fierce came over Dawid's face that I took a step back, but... Right then he dipped, throwing me over his shoulder. He walked to the bar stool and grabbed my coat. I pointed at Roger. 
Don't think I forgot, Big Mouth. I slurred before I took my finger and I sliced it across my neck. Then I pointed back at him. He swallowed visibly. That's what I'm going to do to you. When I catch you, I yelled as he carried me out of the bar. Mad Max, run. You two take the bikes back. We'll take the truck. He opened the passenger side of the truck his men must have arrived in and gently put me on the seat before he reached around me and fastened my seatbelt. Then he walked around the slate in the truck. Seconds later, the tire screeched as he pulled off. Where's this Turk guy, he asked. He and his savages have a camp a few miles south of us. But you don't want to go there. That place is hell on earth, I slurred. I chuckled. It had been so long since I had felt so free. I stuck my arms and head out the window and yelled to the night sky. Woo-hoo! It felt great. When I ducked back into the truck, Dawi was looking at me, shaking his head with a grin on his face. What? I asked him. The smile disappeared from his face. Suddenly, he got real serious. Who is Scott? He asked. I exhaled, shaking my head. The general. The boss. The man is going to find me and then kill me. And just like that, my buzz was dead. Dawi chuckled. Frown and I turned to look at him. You find it funny that I would be dead shortly? I asked. No, baby. I find it funny that you haven't realized yet that I will destroy anyone who touches one hair on your pretty head. I shook my head at him. No, Dawi. You don't want to tangle with the general. He's evil. He's got so much power here in America. You don't want to mess with him. Dawi looked at me. <laughs> you of little faith. Trust me when I tell you. Neither you nor the general has ever seen true power. 